Well, hi guys. Well, we have finally made it out of Manu Wildlife Center and back into the Mother of God. <coughs> Here in Chapter 17 of Peruvian Plunge, <coughs> which we will title Gold Digging on the Mother of God. And you will see why shortly. We're going to start out with a small uh, quote from a fellow named Harold Bloom from the introduction to Don Quixote. What is the object of Don Quixote's quest? I find that unanswerable. Don Quixote says that his quest is to destroy injustice. The quest to enjoy destroy injustice which brings us back to the Mother of God River on Monday morning June 15th 2009. Sorry Cass you cannot join. My third and final Monday morning at Manu Wildlife Center broke gray and chilly, but I wasn't going to let the dreary weather dampen my spirits one bit. I was headed back to the Mother of God, bearing myself downstream to who knew what next Amazon adventure. I gave Miranda a hug goodbye on the dock and turned to face my nemesis for the last time. Oh, what the hell. I gave Kurtzita Racheta a big hug, which she did not return, of course. I hustled my bag of cannonballs over the gunnels of the comfortable tour boat, hopped in, and settled down onto a padded chair for the eight-hour ride. Besides the non-native boat captain and our trusty tour guide Pablo, the only two passengers on the boat were two 70-something bird watchers from Canada. A sweet, lowlitz, little old lady in tennis shoes named Jeannie and her stone-faced, stick-in-the-mud husband, whose name I never learned because he never said one word to me the entire ten hours we were <coughs> within three feet of each other. The one passenger conspicuously missing from the scene, of course, was Marcos, who had been denied passage at the last minute by Kurtzita Ratcheta, his grief-stricken sister, nieces, and nephews would just have to make do without him. There were tables to wait in the Peruvian Amazon, and it took more than death to change that fact in the jungle. Kurtzita untied the boat and shoved us off. The motor fired up into the quiet morning mist, and two minutes later, Manu Wildlife Center and Kurtzita and Miranda and gourmet meals and hot showers and boa and canopy towers slipped away from my sight forever. How quickly and seamlessly one can sink back into the altered state of consciousness of river travel in the jungle, I mused, <clears throat> as the thick vegetation and giant trees rolled on by mile after mile while the drone of the engine threatened to lull me to sleep. <clears throat> Oftentimes when we would round a sharp bend, the steep bank on the outside of the curb curve which took the brunt of the fast-flowing muddy water would be washed away and laid open like the bloody fillet of a freshly skinned catfish. At those moments you could plainly see how eggshell thin and fragile the tiny layer of topsoil really is that supports such a mad riot of vegetation and towering trees. Below this thin layer of organic matter might be 30 feet of rust, of rust colored rock and clay that no root could penetrate. No wonder the trees held themselves aloft with buttresses and vines, and no wonder the Amazon jungle 
is so rapidly becoming the waterlogged Amazon desert as the planet eaters munch on through the forest in their greedy zeal to scalp Mother Earth. For four blessed hours, however, there were no planet eaters to contend with, and we rolled on through mile after mile of primeval primary forest that probably looked a whole lot like it did before Pizarro and his gang of raiders first looted Peru 500 years ago. It was all Jeannie could do to keep up with her frantic scribbling as she fought to fill in the pre-printed blanks on her bird-watching forms. Species, number in flock, date, time, weather, blah, blah, blah. Where does all this crap end up? Gluing her binoculars to her tanned, lined face, she would crow bird-like, as we came around each bend, Rosette Spoonbill, Jabaroo Stork, Wood Stork, White Necked Heron, Little Green Heron, Sun Bittern, Muscovy Duck, Black Skimmer, Amazon Kingfisher, Yellow Headed Vulture, Swallow Tailed Kite, Osprey, Black Hawk, Burrowing Owl. Burrowing Owl? The list went on and on as, Je as Jeannie ratcheted up her lifetime list. All I wanted to see was a lousy anaconda, or at least as a consolation prize, a capybara. My bladder stretched to the bursting point by two cups of coffee. I begged the captain to pull over for a pit stop. I know just the spot coming up. Pablo, who spoke perfect English, assured me. Two minutes later, we drew near to what first appeared to be a rocky beach on the left shore. As we pulled up to it, however, I noticed that the beach had been stripped bare of all vegetation, as if it had been grazed by a brontosaurus. Who knows, maybe it had... Just a few yards back from the waterline, three boxcar-sized pyramids of loose gravel and slag had been heaped there by some unseen giant hand. No bird stirred and no grasshopper whirred in the eerie, still, almost sterile air of the place. What the hell? Your first Madre de Dios gold mine, but certainly not your last, announced Pablo when the motor had died. He indicated the riverside wasteland with a dismissive wave of his hand and weary, ironic smile. This one was just abandoned. I wish I could say the same for the others. Thinking that the ruined crescent of beach was all there was to the abandoned mine. I scrambled out of the boat and up one of the 30-foot-high slag heaps to find a private place to pee as no tree or bush remained standing on the waterline. Cresting the top of the pile of loose stones, my eyes were speared by a shocking sight. Stretching several hundred feet back into the jungle behind the slag heaps was two or three acres of sun-blasted, scorched-earth wasteland in the middle of this ruined, barren moonscape. Covering perhaps a quarter acre was a slimy pool of toxic sludge that looked more like antifreeze than water. Scattered about were stray bits of rusted-out machine parts and plastic jetsam. I added my own stream of human waste to the decoupage of destruction and retreated back to the boat rocking gently in the waters of the Mother of God. This was just a small time operation, what they call a pirate mine, because it had no permits to operate by the Peruvian government, Pablo explained as we waited for the other passengers to finish their business. I asked them if the government had shut this mine down. 
Pablo laughed a yell, right snort. The government has neither the money nor the will to shut these mines down. The miners move in wherever they want to, dig until they think they can do better somewhere else, then move further into the jungle. These guys are sort of set up somewhere else by now. As I had read, but never paid much attention to, the other problem with these mines, legal or illegal, besides the total destruction of the fragile riparian corridor, is the fact that the miners leach the sand and pebbles through mercury, which binds to the gold dust, allowing them to harvest the tiny yellow flecks that have been luring fortune seekers to Peru for centuries. Once the gold is collected, the mercury is washed on down the river to poison the fish and anyone who eats the fish, be it bird, otter, or human, downstream, out of sight, out of mind, like so much else in the jungle. With the Peruvian government's full knowledge and cooperation, hundreds of gallons of the toxic metal are simply washed away down the river for someone else to deal with. As Pablo knew from experience all too close to home, it wasn't just the folks downstream from the mines who suffered. My brother went to work in one of these mines. When he got there, there was no fresh water for the workers to drink. His boss told him, drink from the creeks and river like everybody else. Pretty soon he was sick and then in the hospital for six weeks. He is better now, but he says he will never work in the mines again. Everyone back in the boat, we headed off again. We had not gone a mile before the real nightmarish visions began. They started out small enough with the one or two man small potato operations while one guy would shovel wheelbarrows full of sand and gravel to fill the gravel washing sluices themselves supplied by a gas powered water pump from hell. His buddy would wash the material through the mercury ever alert for the tiny flakes that were the ultimate goal of all this carnage. Working together in teams, these small-time planet nibblers might be able to destroy a few acres of riverside in a year. As we chugged on downstream, we came to the next level of planet eating. Huge dredges set on barges in midstream that sucked the river bottom off its bed like a giant vacuum cleaner sucking up dust from a dirty floor, coughing the sand and rock up onto the huge conveyor belts that were combed through by several workers. The tons of mercury-stained silt were dumped directly back into the heart of the river. But the true undisputed winner of the Planet Eating Blue Ribbon Prize for inflicting hands down the most harm against the Mother of God were not the small potato pirates or the Idaho Baker barges, but the legal official gold mines operated with the full encouragement and permits of the Peruvian government. These full-scale assaults against Mother Earth clearly paid for and operated by some megabuck multinational mining corporation did not screw around with pissant little wheelbarrows and water pumps. To truly lay waste to a planet, you need bulldozers, front-end loaders, and dump trucks the size of houses to move that rock around you could almost smell the mercury hanging in the air. Staring dumbfoundedly at this unbelievable in-your-face carnage 
stretching for miles along both banks of the Mother of God River, and this was just a little bit visible from the boat, I asked myself over and over again, what is humanity getting out of this rotten deal? Except for the few guys at the head of the pack who have probably never even been to Peru and cannot find it on a map, who is the winner in this lose-lose situation? The ladies back in the U.S. with their gold jewelry? Are those little flecks of yellow worth this destruction, this needless swath of death? Could humanity survive without this precious metal being ripped from our precious planet? How much insult could one mother of God take? Of course, all these miners and their poverty-stricken families needed somewhere to call home. The small-time pirates tended to call home tiny little shacks that were really nothing more than overgrown tents made out of bright blue tarps clinging to the muddy riverbanks and little clearings hacked out between the waterline and the jungle. As we passed these forlorn little bivouacs, packs of curious children would stare out at us. I would stare back at them, wondering what kind of life these kids had to look forward to. Clearly not a life in school, as it's hard to run a school bus up and down a river. I asked Pablo his opinion, and he said, dismissively and unconvincingly, These people have a lot more money than you think. They don't have to live this way. They want to live this way. Whatever you say, amigo. <clears throat> The really high rollers in the Peruvian gold mining game got to move to the downright posh community of Rio, Colorado, where they could upgrade from tarp-covered tent to rough plank and tin-roofed hovel. A six-block unbroken line of these depressing miners' shacks stretched along the right riverbank perched atop every other one of them like so many invading flying saucers were shiny new satellite dishes so the miners could come home from a hard day of poisoning themselves with mercury to watch the governor of California blow up terrorists. Pablo explained that the Colorado River a major tributary of the Madre de Dios was being invaded by the miners at an alarming rate. They were pushing deeper and deeper into the pristine million-acre wilderness of the Amaracari Communal Reserve, dumping their silt and their mercury into the river to wind up in the village. When I asked them why the natives the reserve was supposed to protect, put up with his shit, he explained that most of the miners in the reserve were the natives who lived there. Whatever lingering noble savage myth I was still suffering from at that point floated on down the mother of God with the gallons of mercury dumped there by the very Indians who for thousands of years have depended on the river for their food and water. I mean, be real. Who would be crazy enough to live in some hut in the forest when you could live in a house in town with a satellite dish on the roof? The biggest irony in all of this is that the gold miners are opposed to hunt oils petroleum exploration because they think, for some reason I can't fathom, that the oil company will shut down their illegal gold mines. Of course, if that does happen, the gold miners can then always just go to work for Hunt Oil until the oil is gone, at which time they can go back to gold mining. Money is money, and planet eat is, is planet eating what difference could it make?
perhaps an hour beyond the hellhole of Rio Colorado, we entered a heavenly stretch of the Mother of God that, so far anyway, you know, in 2009, has not been invaded by the planet eaters yet. We pulled onto a rocky beach on a large island for a much welcome picnic lunch. I hopped out of the boat and was immediately scolded by, by Jeannie for supposedly scaring some invisible bird. I think it was the gray-speckled boulder bird that only she could see among the jumble of rocks. I waited patiently for her to take her photo, searching in vain for one feather, beak, or eyeball among the pebbles. All anybody is going to see in that photo is a pile of rocks, Jeannie's nameless husband groused, echoing my sentiments exactly. I took my brown bag and headed down the beach to eat my lunch in private. In the mud between the stones, I could make out dozens, if not hundreds, of strange animal tracks. Capybara, I remembered Marino explaining to me. I spread my lunch out along a huge flat log half buried in the mud and sand and began to eat. A movement some 20 yards down the beach caught my eye. But first appeared to be four dull brown mud-covered boulders, two the size of St. Bernard's, two the size of Cocker Spaniels, morphed before my eyes into a family of huge, round, rotund guinea pigs. My first, and so far only, capybara sighting. Despite a lifetime of seeing dozens of photos and videos of these guys, the world's largest rodent by a landslide, nothing had prepared me for the sheer bulk of these overstuffed monsters, from the tip of their boxy noses to their fat, strangely human-looking bottoms. Somehow, I had always figured these humongous aquatic rodents would look like big beavers, but these guys, perhaps because they were fully out of the water enjoying a sunbath, looked more like pigs or even tapers, amazingly unafraid of me. These favorite dishes of Amazon Indian stew pots did not flee in terror back into the river, but simply ambled off nonchalantly into the forest. If Marino had been there, he could have dropped one with a rock. No problem. Lunch over with, we piled back into the boat for the last hour-long leg of our river journey. The unexplained stretch of still wild river soon gave way again to the wanton havoc being wreaked by the planet eaters. I can't imagine all this activity is very good for the local wildlife that lives along these riverbanks, Jeannie's nameless husband announced to nobody in particularly in the understatement of the century as if this startling realization had just dawned on him. No shit, Sherlock, I muttered under my breath. Rounding a bend, I spied on a ridge above the right bank ahead of us a sight I had not seen since leaving Cusco more than three weeks before. A cell phone tower. Spying the same tower, Pablo whipped out his cell phone to call our driver. Five minutes later, almost exactly eight hours after hugging Kurt Zita Racheta goodbye forever, we emerged from the gold mine ravaged rainforest to the ground zero of hell, known appropriate, appropriately enough as Labyrintho, the Labyrinth, Peru. I wrestled my bag of cannonballs out of the boat, stuffed one of my torn $20 bills into the boat captain's hands, and staggered up the steep stairs only to find myself ensnared and enmeshed in the horn-honking, engine-racing, diesel-choking, radio-blaring, cell-phone-ringing, dog-barking, chicken-crowing, 
purse-snatching, knife-wielding, gun-toting, wife-beating, child-abusing, cerveza-guzzling, drunk-staggering, tourist-gouging, penny-pinching, paint-peeling, vomit-inducing, headache-pounding, hair-raising, stomach-churning, heart-stopping, pulse-racing, ear-splitting, nerve-rattling, grease-splattered, garbage-strewn madness of life on a Monday afternoon in the Peruvian Amazon. <clears throat> Thanks to the wonders of cell phone technology in the Amazon rainforest, our chauffeur was waiting for us at the top of the stairs above the dock, so we did not need to suffer for long the third world charms of the labyrinth. He herded the four of us into our private car, a rusted out ancient tin can of a microbus that had probably been auctioned off for scrap about the same time that Bill Clinton was lighting up a cigar with Monica Lewinsky. The driver was all set to go and the passengers were all set to go. Unfortunately, the tin can wasn't. When the driver turned the key, all we heard was the pathetic clicking of a dead battery. Por favor, the driver said sheepishly, indicating that Pablo and I were to get out and push start the van. The two of us climbed out into the hot sun and did what we needed to do, much to the delight of the zonked out entertainment star dog lookers. I looked at the line of modern white Toyota cabs advertising air-conditioned comfortable rides to Puerto Maldonado, 30 miles away, for three bucks. Like the hard-headed cheapskate damn fool that I am, I ignored the whisper of spirit to jump in one of those taxis and return to the sweltering, smoking, shuddering, sputtering bus. How long does it take to get to Puerto Maldonado, I asked Pablo, as we started to roll in the first vehicle I had been in since May 29th. Hell, it was only 30 miles. How long could it take? Well, that depends on how many birds. Birds? What birds we see along the road, said our indefatigable ortho ornithologist of a tour guide. We could make it in a half an hour if there's not too much construction. Construction? What construction? But it could easily take two hours if we stop to look for birds. <clears throat> I've been looking at birds for three weeks. I'm ready to look at a cold beer, I joked in all seriousness. And this bus isn't exactly what I would call dependable. You know my vote. Tension-filled silence descended over the bus. I had been studying the habits of Ecotouristicus canadensis in the undisturbed primary rainforest for 17 days and thought I knew a little about them, but nothing could have prepared me for the iron-willed antics of the Canadian gray-crowned lolits in the logged-out wasteland we now found ourselves in. Black-crested, blue-eyed, scarlet-rumped, yellow-bellied, green-footed shrub jay squawked a pissing in her khakis excited genie before we barely made it out of the labyrinth. She grabbed her camera and jumped out of the now caulked out van to cross her 118th bird of the day off her lifetime list. I scanned the sad little bushes and saw some bird that looked a whole lot like a fucking blue jay to me. Five minutes, late, five minutes after Pablo and I had given ourselves heat stroke, push starting the van down the dusty dirt road, almost getting flattened by three air-conditioned $3 cabs flying past us at 60 miles per hour in the process, we were slammed to a halt by the next excited shriek, dust-covered, bleary-eyed, choking grass sparrow. Referring to the 
bleak, sad landscape of ruined rainforest that had all the cheer of New Orleans' ninth ward after Hurricane Katrina blew through, Jeannie warbled without a trace of irony. This new landscape has allowed all kinds of savanna species to move into this area where they've never been able to survive before. Good for the savanna species, I thought to myself. In a half hour, we'd made it about five miles, at which point I was startled to find we were intersecting with a broad, smooth, modern paved highway. Cars, trucks, and buses barreled by at 60, if not 70 miles per hour. The brand new highway shot arrows straight across the treeless, logged out landscape. We turned east towards Puerto Maldonado, some 25 miles ahead, and the decrepit little bus rocketed up to its top speed of perhaps 40 miles per hour. Unfortunately, we had not gone more than a mile before we were forced to a crawl behind some planet-eating monstrosity that looked like it had just eaten half of Madre de Dios for lunch. No wonder it had caterpillar written on the side. There was barely a leaf visible for miles around. What the hell is this road, I asked Pablo. Two of my guidebooks, 13 and 9 years old respectively, say the road to Puerto Maldonado is supposed to be the single worst road in Peru. <clears throat> I had, in fact, been almost looking forward to traveling it in a masochistic sort of way to see what horror would earn a road such a dubiously illustrious title. Four years ago, that was true, Pablo said. Welcome to the famous Transoceanic Highway. It used to take two or even three days to drive from Cusco to Puerto Maldonado. Today, it takes 18 hours. When the last stretch over the Andes is paved next year, it will take six or seven hours. You will be able to drive all the way from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic in a week, a trip that took more than a month just a few years ago. Who is paying for all of this, I asked, staring at what had to be several million dollars worth of machinery lining both shoulders. Surely not Peru. Peru is borrowing the money from Brazil, but everybody knows where the money is coming from. This kind of money could only come from China. So this was the infamous Brazil to China highway from hell that I'd heard all the rumors about. The awful road from Cusco to Manu, not to mention the broken stretch across the Amaracari Reserve, had lulled me naively into thinking that those mealy-mouthed tree-huggers were overstating their case about the impending collapse of the Western Amazon. If anything, I realized, the case was being vastly understated. The taming of the green hell that had begun 40 years ago was in its final mop-up stages. What the U.S. had begun, China was about to finish. The Amazon rainforest and planet Earth right behind it were doomed. <clears throat> Is that a long-eared, spectacled, tubescent toad bird? Jeannie chirped excitedly, peering through her field glasses at the forlorn, ragged skeleton of a once proud and regal tree that no doubt had, been, had once been home to dozens of species of birds. No, dear, that's your common Amazon stick bird, growled her nameless husband, echoing my sentiments exactly. Not to be deterred, 
Jeannie, who had been on code orange bird alert for 10 straight hours and showed no sign of flagging in the sweltering van, insisted that the driver stop, meaning, you know what, in front of a scraggly herd of emaciated beef cattle. There, in front of the fourth cow from the left, a black bird with red wings. Let me take a wild guess. A red-winged blackbird, I muttered under my breath as Jeannie, her husband, and Pablo all piled out of the bus to set up the camera, complete with tripod, to get the beautiful postcard shot of cows and blackbirds in setting sun. A speeding cabbie blared his horn and shook his fist at the idiot bird watchers standing in the middle of the highway. Turistas! Locas, no, I said to the driver. That bird is probably the single most common bird in America. If nothing else, the smooth level pavement, pavement made it easier to push start a broken down microbus. Roadside hawk, screeched Jeannie at a hawk perched on a power line on an, appropriately enough, side of the road. The increasingly irritated driver kept right on going. What did they call it before there were any roads here? Her husband chimed in sarcastically, echoing my sentiments exactly. Just past the roadside hawk, we let Jeannie, her husband, and Pablo off at some ritzy tourist lodge on the edge of town I slipped my last ripped 20 to Pablo, and the exhausted driver and I limped on in to downtown Puerto Maldonado, a carbon copy of Labyrintho, only six times bigger and ten times worse under the dying light of a glorious Amazon sunset. Based on the driver's glowing recommendations, I checked into the roach trap of the Royal Inn Hotel, situated directly on the city's busiest and noisiest intersection. It may as well have been in the Tenderloin in downtown San Francisco as in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon. Somehow, I mustered the strength to stretch my legs along a few dirty city sidewalks, scrounge a Chinese surprise, surprise dinner of sweet and sour pork, slurp down a 55 gallon drum of ice cold cerveza, and answer two dozen emails. When I collapsed into my lumpy bed at 9 p.m. amidst the roar of motorcycle engines and honking horns, I had 30 bucks to my name. And that uh, winds up chapter 17 in Puerto Maldonado, Peru, for you in chapter 18. We'll hear all you ever need to know about Puerto Maldonado, Peru, coming right up. Bye, guys.